In this video, we're going to talk about the classical and medieval West. So, starting in Greece, the Greeks believed that humans were the highest creation of nature. They were the closest things to perfection in physical form. Also, humans had the power of reason and logic. So, because of all of this, there was a major cultural emphasis on the individual, which led to the development of democracy. Also, these thoughts affected their religion because they had gods with human-like weaknesses and humans with god-like strengths. And the major Greek periods we're going to talk about are Archaic, Classical, and Hellenistic. So starting with the Archaic period, which was from the late 7th to the early 5th century BCE, we see that the Greeks have assimilated influences from Egypt and the Near East. And we know from literature and other representations of the time period that the painters were actually better known than the sculptors, even though a few wall paintings still survive. It's also during this time that the red figure style is developed, which we see on this crater. And a crater is a vessel used for mixing ceremonial beverages. The example of which we see here shows a scene from Homer's Odyssey. Also in the archaic period, we see figurative sculptures. And the chorus that we see here can be described as a life-sized, freestanding nude male figure in a rigid front position. Translated directly, it means male youth, and we can see the influences from the Egyptian style where we have the arms to the side, fingers drawn up, the left leg forward, weight evenly distributed, and staring straight ahead. It looks really similar. So while they're borrowing the Egyptian form and sculptural techniques, they are altering it to fit their cultural values. For instance, Egyptians decided to depict celestial forms and supernatural rulers but the Greeks depicted individuals, again, focusing on the humanness. Next, we move into the classical period of Greece, which was from 480 to 323 BCE. During this period, the artwork emphasized rational simplicity, order, and restrained emotion. We can see in the difference between these sculptures and the one we just looked at that there's more of an interest in lifelike naturalism and idealized anatomy. A great example of this is contraposto, or counterpoised, which we can see the difference here versus the koros we just looked at. These figures are carrying their weight mainly on one foot with the other leg kind of relaxed, where the other one it was very evenly distributed weight. But in this scenario, the figures look way more naturalistic, almost like they're in the process of moving, because this is how we stand in reality. It looks like reality because it reflects it more directly. Whereas no one really stands really stiff with straight legs, evenly balanced, one leg forward, one leg back. And we see this again happening in the Renaissance because they found these sculptures and were inspired by their naturalism. So the figure on the left is called the Spear Bearer, and as the title suggests, he was once bearing a spear. It was in his outstretched hand and leaning on his left shoulder. So again, the Greeks believed that humans were a perfect form of nature. And the artist who created the spear bearer believed that he had found the perfect human proportions to be harmonious and divinely inspired ratios. He measured a bunch of models and believed that he had found ratios and formulas to go with their measurements, thus creating this sculpture from those numbers, representing more so an idea or an ideal body, not necessarily depicting a portrait of a single person. And on the right, we have the Venus de Medici, and this sculpture was actually created later in the period, and looking at the difference between the two, we can see an attitude shift. Whereas the spear bearer is more a celebration of the human form, it's very serious, he looks like he's gazing off into the distance. The Venus's tone and attitude is far more sensuous, it's showing the female ideals, but it also looks like we've walked in on something we weren't supposed to see, because she's trying to cover up. There's more of an interaction between the viewer and the sculpture because she's responding to our gaze. So we're still in the classical period, but we're looking at architecture now. Buildings were mostly religious and symmetrical using a post and beam system, which we can see here. And in this diagram, we see different kinds of capital, which are design elements at the top of a column. And these define the different architectural orders, of which there are three. First is the Doric, which is very simple and geometric. Next is the Iconic, which is taller and more decorative, and then the last one is Corinthian, which is more complex and organic. However, this image really shows the differences better than I can describe them. The Parthenon is a great example of the Doric order, and it's seated on the Acropolis, which was a large rock formation above the city. Throughout different components of the building is the harmonious ratio of 4 to 9, which is again a reflection of the Greek 
love of logic and order and proportions. The building itself was actually painted in really bright colors. It's not just white as we see it today. And it was constructed as a tribute to Athena Parthenos, which was the goddess of wisdom and war. And to honor Athena, the Greeks constructed a 40-foot golden statue of her. And the building was oriented on the Acropolis such that on her birthday, the sun would rise and illuminate the statue, which just reiterates the importance of logic, order, and math. To take their love of perfection a step further, the Greeks utilized entesis when creating the building. So when we look at straight lines, there's optical illusions that are happening that we can't really help where things get a little distorted, and the Greeks accounted for that. So that when we look at it, it's satisfyingly perfect. All of the lines are straight, even though they're not actually straight. We just perceive them as such. So to do this, they created imperceivable bulges. So just slightly above the centers of each column, on the tops of doorways, on the steps, and on the floor. To trick our eye into perceiving them as exactly perfectly straight. Instead of seeing the perspectival distortions that we would normally perceive on a building that is actually totally straight and squared off everywhere. So basically, our eyes are imperfect and we would unconsciously distort perfect buildings, so they made an imperfect building that appears perfect to accommodate those distortions. So metopes were featured on the Parthenon as well. These are intricately decorated square panels that are installed above the colonnade which is a long series of columns connected by a roof. Oftentimes, they depicted classical Greek legends and stories, and they were integral to promoting Greek culture. This example here depicts the Battle of the Lapiths and the Centaurs, which functioned as a metaphor for the Greek victory over the Persians. This is actually where the funding for the building came from, because they had so much money left over after their win. Next, we move into the Hellenistic period, which occurred about 323 BCE, around the death of Alexander the Great, to about 30 BCE, which was when the Roman conquest of Egypt happened. Hellenistic means Greek-like, because the art was mainly produced for non-Greek patrons. The work was less idealized and logical, and more concerned with being expressive, emotive, and dynamic, with exaggerated movement, like we see in this example, in which the figures are all very active, we can see them writhing and contorting in pain. They're not in the calm, relaxed contraposto we previously saw. So this sculpture represents Laocoon, who actually warned the city of Troy about the Trojan horse, which obviously upset the Greek deities who were on the Greek side. So they sent these serpents to attack him, and that was his punishment. This is also another example of hierarchy of scale, because the main figure is much larger than the other two. Moving on to Rome, who became a major power in the West by the 2nd century BCE. At its height, it included Western Europe, Northern Africa, and the Near East, along with the shore of the Mediterranean. Some of the practical politics and order had very lasting effects that we see even today, such as government, their calendar, festivals, religion, and the language. The art during this time was practical, with very hyper-real, quote, warts and all portraiture, it was focused on highlighting imperfections to get an accurate portraiture without idealizing and erasing them. For example, we see in this bust that the figure has wrinkles in his brow and his forehead to be more accurate to his likeness. So some major achievements during this time in Rome were civil engineering, town planning, and architecture. They made architectural advances with the round arch, which are found in arcades, barrel vaults, and domes. Within the architectural context, an arcade is a passageway with arch forms along one or both sides. A major architectural achievement was the Colosseum. It was created primarily for amusement, like gladiator matches and wild game hunts. It could seat between 50,000 and 70,000. Its shape was comprised of a cylindrical form capped by a hemispherical dome, which is basically a half sphere, with a portico. Portico is one entrance framed by a columned porch. So far as Roman painting, it inherited many principles from the previous Hellenistic cultures, mainly from the Greeks. It sought to create a sense of common space by avoiding one-point perspective altogether, so there's no perspectival lines and no receding back into space. It's very flattened spatially. 
There was a focus on pleasing formal qualities like shapes, patterns, colors, and scale instead of trying to create an illusionistic three-dimensional pictorial space. Moving right along to the early Christian and Byzantine, the Roman and Byzantine emperors were greatly infected by Christianity after Jesus' death in 33 CE. With the art, we see stylistic changes as there's more of a simplified interpretation of the Roman figure paintings. There's more of an emphasis on storytelling now. Also during this time, Christianity is initially seen as a cult by the Romans, and they try to suppress it with law. As a result, Christians primarily worshipped in private homes and in catacombs, which were underground burial chambers. By 313, the Emperor Constantine has acknowledged Christianity. However, Rome itself has begun to decline, so the people turned away from secular political realms for stability and have turned more to religion for this. So the art also changes as a result of this. We see this in the eyes primarily. They're very exaggerated and hyperbolic to represent an inner spiritual life. Symbolism and story are now trumping naturalism of the previous periods. Moving on to 330, Constantine moves the capital from Rome to Byzantium, which he then rebuilt into Constantinople, or present-day Istanbul. In 395, as a result of the capital change, the empire becomes divided with two rulers, one being in Rome and one being Constantinople. Looking at the early Christian and Byzantine architecture, we're going to start with the Basilica. It started as the Roman Assembly Hall, but was adapted to a place of public worship in Byzantium. It was designed to include a long hall flanked by columns. The apse of these church forms were a semicircular structure at each end of the basilica, and they served as a meeting space for government bodies and law courts. Now the long central aisle that runs down the center of the basilica, with an apse on each end, was called the nave. Here we have the schematic image of what this would look like, as well as a pictorial reference. Next we're going to look at mosaics. So the individual piece of colored glass, ceramic tile, or stone is called a tessera, or tesserae for plural. Throughout different media, when depicting figures, there was a large controversy between those who wanted to visually tell stories and have aids, especially for people who couldn't read, and those who wanted to avoid idols, which was the making and worshipping of false images explicitly prohibited by the Bible. So the resolution they kind of landed on was using symbolic stylized icons or images to tell the stories without being confused for an idol or a real person. And they accomplished this by emphasizing the wide eyes for spirituality and a major collapse in three-dimensional pictorial space, which they accomplished with flat elements like decorations and patterns. Moving on to 726, the Byzantine Emperor Leo III orders the destructions of the images of Christ, Mary, saints, and angels. He thought people would worship the icons instead of the divine beings themselves which again was prohibited by the Bible. As a result, iconoclasts or image breakers would punish people who had these images by flogging or even blinding them. These people also favored the emperor's power over local monasteries that themselves had many, many depictions of Christ, making them iconophiles, people who favored these images because they felt that it truly represented Jesus' nature of being human and divine, there was the physical reality of the icon, but then the divine that was supposed to go beyond it. You weren't supposed to worship the icon, but what it represented. And by 843, church officials overturned Leo's decree. After this period, the new imagery surrounding Jesus was the Pantocrator, which depicted him as the ruler of the universe. One such example we see here in the Hagia Sophia, which unfortunately is a mosaic that is now destroyed. Moving forward, after the controversy of how to depict Christ, the clergy closely monitored representations of him. And as previously stated, they favored imagery that inspired devotion, but not direct worship. And icons were small images that aimed to do just this. Stylistically, this period really absorbed a lot of flat patterns and non-representational designs, along with utilizing hierarchy of scale from Islam and other Eastern influences. Next, we're going to discuss the European Middle Ages, which occur about a thousand years between the fall of the Roman Empire and the renaissance of the Greek-Roman ideas in the 15th century. 
So early Christian art mixed with the culture of their invaders, which were nomadic people traveling from northwestern China to central Europe. And as per the nature of being nomadic, the tribes skillfully created durable and portable metal workings that they could take with them. And we see these styles combined with the early Christian art we just discussed, they're most evidently combined in Ireland in the illustrated holy books. The first letters of these books become more embellished over time from just being in the margin to being an entire page, an example of which we can see in this bottom photo. Romanesque as a term is used to define all medieval art in Western Europe during the 11th and 12th centuries, as there is a revival of Roman principles of stone construction like the round arch and the barrel vault. During this time, we see feudalism, which is a complex system of obligations based on ranks of local leaders, and monasticism, which describes monasteries serving as centers for cultural and educational advancement. During this time, relics were a very big part of Christianity, and a relic is a preserved remain or possession of a saint. Some claim to have a piece of the cross Jesus died on, or a piece of fabric that a saint wore, or even a piece of their body. All of those would be considered relics. Now, reliquaries were chambers that housed these sacred objects. They served as important hubs for pilgrimages, which were very popular among Christians at this time. For example, during the Canterbury Tales. This particular reliquary is said to house a martyr's skull and bones. Within Benedictine monasteries, hand-copying Christian texts was seen as a sacred duty. And we see this in just rewriting the Bible or in illuminated manuscripts. Illuminated texts are texts with decorated lettering and even some illustrations in the margins. Now, Byzantine churches had round arches and vaults for stability, and they replaced their wooden roofs with stone vaults because wooden roofs were flammable. And in these stones, they had imaginative relief carvings that actually came from the illuminated texts the most elaborate of which were over doorways, as we can see in this example. And we see the use of hierarchy of scale again. Moving on to 1145, we see that Gothic architecture replaces the Romanesque. It has pointed arches that can be seen from afar, they're so tall. Many stained glass windows that allow a lot of light into the space. It's full of light to be symbolic for God's presence. And because these spaces were so large, they often served for meetings, concerts, and religious plays because they could fit the whole town. Other characteristics of the architecture were flamboyant aspects, which are basically just double curved forms, and they create flame-like textures and patterns. Also the fine buttress, which was a support at a right angle to an outer wall. And again here we see the schematic versus the actual building. Analyzing these different time periods and the different art, artifacts, and crafts, I think we can really track the different concerns of each time period. We can really look at culture through these objects. We move from Egypt's very strict and rigid depiction of celestials and figures to the Koros, which was a little bit more human, using a similar form but for a different cultural function. It was more personal and about individuals and humanness. Then we see the spear bearer and how it looks way more naturalistic with the contraposto. Then we move to the Venus, who's more sensual, who's more aware of the viewer. Then Lacan is writhing in pain and in this really dynamic pose. Then we move on to the Roman bust that really focuses in on little details and flaws to create really accurate portraiture. Then with the head of Constantine, we go totally stylistic again with the big eyes to represent spirituality. Those are a lot of changes that are almost cyclical. We go from symbolic to as naturalistic as you can get, right back to symbolic again. And each of those variations in the depiction of the figure really showed what was important to that culture at that time. Another so what? We see the origins of major conventions that still exist today. And I will leave you with the fact that Greek sculptures were actually very colorful and not totally white. The way that we see them today is not the way they were intended to look. These images come from the show Gods in Color. It features reconstructions that are painted to what scientists think these sculptures would have looked like based on the pigments they found on the surface. Researchers combined their knowledge of the time as well as technology to actually examine the surface of the material. 
to create what they think these Greek sculptures actually would have looked like. So my questions to you are, does seeing these sculptures painted feel weird to you? If so, think about how and why. How have the white marble sculptures we all recognize affect our understanding, or even bias of art in this time period or in general? Do the colors remind you of other art movements, times, or cultures? How do you feel now having made these comparisons? And on that note, I'm going to conclude the lecture. So be sure to get some sleep and stay safe.